Hey guys, and welcome to the Life Switch Show. We are back this week. It's a Wednesday. It's a live show. We're uh, we're bringing on guests to talk about uh, very powerful switches that they've done in their own lives. So we are talking to James Tucker today, and we are talking about mental health in business and in, in entrepreneurship. So before we get into that, uh, I I wanted to remind you, if you're on YouTube right now watching this, don't forget to like, subscribe and click that notification bell to be notified every time we go live or every time there is a new uh, episode released. And if you're watching this from the Facebook page, you can go in and like my Facebook page, Adam Kavalik Life Coach. Uh, you might even be catching this on my personal page as well. And if you're on one of those platforms, you can comment in the comment sections just below this video. That way we are bringing those questions, those comments into the show live. That way we can answer them, we can interact with them. So you get to be part of the show. Okay, I am super stoked that you're here and I'm even more stoked that my guest James is here. So um, let's get into it. All right. So I want to make an, a big introduction of my, my guest, James Tucker. Now, for anyone who's joining right now, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Adam Kavalik. I'm the host of this Life Switch show. Now, the Life Switch show is a show where we have conversations around changes, transformations in life and sometimes even in business. My good friend James, he is an inspiration to me in many, many ways. The way he runs a business, the way he's committed to his business and the, the, the transformations that he's done in his own uh, life. So James Tucker from Manchester, who loves movies just as much as I do, I think, uh, which is a lot. Let me tell you that James's hobby uh, is surfing running and he's a volleyball extraordinaire. Uh, he's the co-founder at Cruise Creative Media, a digital content creator, content marketing strategist, agile content marketer, event speaker and live stream producer in the biggest sense because he is part of running this show. Um, and today Agata, the second half of uh, the um, uh, Cruise Creative Media is, is doing it for him. Now, let me welcome my good friend and partner, James Tucker. Wow. <laughs> what can well, I say? Well, I put that together. It, it's <laughs> not, I mean, it was even hard for me to try to make it small enough because there's a lot to say. And, uh. and, and the funny thing is, over the last week, because yeah. we've been talking about this, this episode, this show, uh, I'm finding out more and more things about you. So I was like, I know. you know, I had to put, a, put, put an end to it somewhere. Yeah, I know. I'm a dark horse. <laughs> <laughs> people yeah. find that people who spend more time with me find out and kind of go, "Hey, how do you fit all this time into you, into your yeah. life?" Yeah. But what an introduction! Yeah. Really, thank you so, thank you so much. Well, that's I couldn't, my pleasure. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have actually put it better myself. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll send you the introduction if you want to put it somewhere on LinkedIn or whatever. <laughs> please, yeah, please do, because that'd be perfect for my LinkedIn profile. But thanks yeah. a lot for having us on, because this is a complete change. It's not... I've been on the show before. <laughs> yes. As a, <laughs> brief, as a brief mistake, appearance, because as Adam said, I usually run the uh, production studio for your, for your live show mm -hmm. uh, when you go live every Wednesday. And super thankful for having me on as well well as you know a show for an hour <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> now when we discussed that uh, I, I don't know how that came about but it was kind of like uh, um, you just threw it in there like hey I I could go on your show right yeah, when yeah. we're talking about guests and I was like that's that's great that's brilliant we should and as we started preparing for it I realized you <laughs> probably could have been my very first guest and could have been, actually. that would have been yeah, an yeah, amazing yeah, 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 yeah. show yeah, yeah. just to talk about that. So yeah. I'm so glad that you threw it in there and I'm so glad that you're able to be on this show. And oh. also this time in front of the camera deliberately, not by, by accident. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, you've, you've got a great story. You've got a great, uh, great vast experience. Mm. And I'm super honored to, 
to be you know have this conversation for the next 50 so minutes uh because i think there is a lot that we can take away from this no no I, I wanted to say uh before i just kind of let you loose on this mental health especially mm. that like the whole thing mental health in business i think is super important two years ago i was invited to be the ambassador for um this initiative in Sweden, uh, there was an organization called, uh, th uh, hang on, uh, Triathlon Vastina. That's how you say it in Swedish. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's uh, triathlon. Tri <laughs> triathlon. Yeah, there we go. Triathlon in a, uh, in a, in a place in Sweden, a beautiful place in Sweden, an old uh, royal castle and everything. And they run around, they swim, they do all kinds of things. And I got to be the ambassador for that, the speaker of that event. And that whole event is organized around supporting mental health in Sweden. Mm. So I had some talks, lectures and stuff like that. We did, um, we gave a lot of money to courses around mental health. Mm. And it was just a fabulous event altogether. And it really opened up my eyes around the, 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 the topic of mental health in business, especially, mm -hmm. I think, because a lot of businesses were involved. Um, when I got to speak about mental health, stress and the negative effects of that and, and the performance, people were just like, they were so open about their own experiences and how that impacted them. So I got really, really interested in that. So when you brought this up, hey, what about mental health in business? I was like, wow, I... Mm. I think it's such an important topic to talk about and not just in business, of course, because this applies to, you know, society in general, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a crossover in everything, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's in your own yeah. life. It's in your own business. It affects everything. It affects every single, you know, minute, second of your time and day. So, of course, yeah. it's going to have an impact on your personal, private life, but as well mm -hmm. as business as well and I think yeah. kind of going forward even though mental health has improved in terms of in the media and support and what's out there now they're still really relatively kind of a, um, a sort of negative stigma about it really you know mm -hmm. people still don't um, speak up about it even personally myself as well because you know you kind of think and say you know do I suffer with mental health issues and straight away people think oh my god you know What's his, what's, his, what's his person like? I actually read, actually, only the other day. There was a study by Michael Freeman. Um, and he says that for most entrepreneurs or high successful business people, 50% are more likely to suffer with mental health. And I read another mm. article where it was actually 70%. So 50, 70% suffer with uh, mental health issues. And that could be anything to do with you know, depression, uh, substance abuse. And even, you know, at worst case scenarios, uh, suicidal thoughts. Mm. Um, I mean, it's one of the biggest killers amongst men, um, you know, plus 40. So you can, you can see sort of how bad that is. But also, on the, that's the downside. Of, if you're an entrepreneur, that's the downside because the upside is the complete opposite. You know, most people who suffer with those downsides have, you know, quite, they're highly creative. They've got empathy. They've got um, their adaptiveness. They've got humour. Now I'm talking about humour because most people will say James is a great James is a great guy. He's always smiling. You know, he's always got his white teeth showing. Just out of interest, these are not veneers. They're my real teeth. <laughs> which, which is which is a surprise. <laughs> yeah, it's out there. So people will look at me and kind of go, "This guy's like super super happy." Yeah, yeah. he's always smiling. You know, he's. But I'll be honest with you, and I can put to, you know, honor my heart, really, and say, I do, even now, I still have a mental health issue, but I know the strat strategies now hmm. to overcome them. Do I suffer with depression? Yeah. But I, but I cope with it better than I did do five, four, three years ago. Uh, do I suffer with anxiety? Yes, of, of course I do. And that's when we, I know we're talking on the focus around business. But it's a bigger part. If you suffer with depression and anxiety, it's pretty much 100% of the time of your life. And, of course, everybody has to go out and work. So, of course, it's going to affect you um, in your business life as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on this topic, um, and I'm interested to see if, you, if you've got something to add to this. Um, a lot of the studies that I've taken part of when it comes to uh, mental health, 
shows that and and there is a little bit of um at least it was when i was was studying this myself they say that 90 percent of all mental health issues come from or like mm. hang on so what, what's the actual way they say this they say that if you're suffering from mental health 90 percent of those cases you you have it's either coming from the fact that you're having uh, sleep disorders or because of the mental health issues, you're having sleep disorders or, mm. or issues with sleeping. Now, and, and that's where the study is. Well, the, the research, the body of research is a bit wide because it's, at sometimes they're going like, it's the sleep deprivation that is the fertile environment for the mental health issues to arise. And at other times, they're not completely sure. They're saying maybe also the mental health uh, issue is creating the, the, the trouble with sleeping. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In, in my experience, it's when we don't sleep properly, when we don't get that rest, that has terrible consequences and effects. And a lot of times when I talk about performance, and this can be performing and in a physical uh, element, or it can be about business, performance in general, there is a formula for performance, high performance. And the formula is stress plus recovery equals mm. performance and or development. Mm. Now, if you take away recovery, all you have is stress. And anyone who knows that, you know, been running too fast, too long, they know that there is a, there's a decline in, in their productivity, their performance over time. Mm. You simply run out of gas. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you take away the stress and all you have is recovery, well, you're not really going to get anything done either. So you're not having performance. You're not having, you, you don't have development. I truly think, um, I truly think it is very, very important to be aware of the, the, the sleep, the, the, um, you know, the rest in, especially in business because it's a high performance environment a lot of times. Um, I mean, based on this, like, is, is there anything you can add to this, this so true conversation? That. I mean, I kind of, um, as you nicely put in your introduction, you know, going back years ago, I was always quite a high performing sports person, you know, mm -hmm. whether that was running. My main sport was actually rugby and I was absolutely mm -hmm. really dedicated. It played quite good, a high level. Even when I finished with rugby, I got into triathlons, I got into cycling, I got into running. Everything was planned out meticulously you know so it was a case of the right food um the right amount of training but also what came into it was the right amount of sleep you know so mm -hmm. i slept right which gave me the performance the problem to that is is that's from a physical point of view so you can measure things from a physical um performance but for some reason when we come to sort of our state of mind our mental health uh well-being we forget about those things. We forget that mm. sleep has a detrimental effect on, you know, your mind. It's almost like you kind of like, you know, it's kind of put to one side. You know, it's kind of a case of like, if you had a broken leg, what do you do? You go to <laughs> A&E, it's something mm. physical, you can see it, it hurts. Um, others are your legs broken. <laughs> you go to A&E, you get it fixed, it's in plaster. If you have something else, I mean, if, from a severe point of view, if a heart attack, you go to hospital, you get it fixed. With mental health, though, it's very, very hard to to reach out and to get that fixed. And like what you said with regards to sleep, sleep's like super important for everything. So it's not just the physical, you know, from a sports point of view or a physicality point of view, it's also there for your mind as well. Of course, don't forget, you know, our brains are a, a functioning organ. You know, mm -hmm. they do have times of you know damage or just aging as well you know mm. if i compare to myself like what i am now in my 40s to what i was in my 20s you know it was completely you know different also to go on i mean we had this conversation it's probably going on a little bit we had this conversation over the weekend um ourselves and how it affect how it affected me was really kind of it was almost like stereotypical really so i'm 46 now most things in terms of mental health happened to me when I was probably at the start of maybe 38, 30, 39. 
Um, obviously, there was external factors that were included in that. Um, but life-wise, from the day I was born, I had a good family. I was good at school. Uh, Agatha will hate me saying this, but I was good academically. Um, I was good at sports. I was popular with the girls. Yeah. But then I went to university and had a good education. You know, I had a good education from leaving school, a good ed education from university. Then having, uh, you know, the, the nice family, the wedding, you know, top wedding, top job, top car. I mm. never had any crisis moments. So if you think from like the day zero to, let's say, yeah, 37, you know, 38, there was no impact um, in my life in my life mm. and then all of a sudden i then made a bad decision and a bad decision led to another decision and also to throw it into the mix i had just life just kicking you you know things unexpected you know like i had a car crash so while i made a bad decision i was getting over that i had a car crash then i had a divorce then he went on to one thing after another i had a relative who a close relative that then passed away and it was all in the in one after the other uh and obviously kind of got on top of me and it got to a point where i was like wow why am i making these bad decisions we all we all make bad decisions um but it was getting to me i was depressed mm. i was anxious it got to a very severe point where i got to a point where really i was suicidal where i mm. was actually to a point Apologies, because some of this is going to be quite raw, especially, you know, my mum's probably watching as well because she's always a super fan. So I'm kind of probably coming up with, um, you know, past stories. And it got to a point where, yeah, I was taking my own life. And thankfully, I was captured away from that and brought to safety. But the safety was really, and I'm going to be blunt about this and frank about it, was um, it was a mental health hospital. Mm. I don't know, we talked about films, you know, in terms of, you know, what do you like in your top 10? Well, my top 10 <laughs> film was um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest. Uh, one of my favorite actors is um, <laughs> Jack Nicholson. And I felt yeah. like, seriously, I kind of was in this room where it wasn't too, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but it wasn't too indifferent. And I was like, I know you can't swear on it. And I was like, what the is going on? What? has happened you know why am i in this situation why um did i get to a, such a low point where i was in a suicidal suicidal situation and now i'm in this position where i had everything and you know and even at that point again to be kind of like frank about it i was actually effectively bank wise zero homeless what do i what do i do to kind of escape you know, from this, mm. uh, there was no, there was no go to. And so I actually did. I know it sounds kind of like almost like really kind of like a case of a rev revelation. And I was in this room and I was just was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm destroying close friends, family, uh, especially say, you know, like my parents. And uh, I just said, I've got to stop. I've got to go from zero, you know, from zero on um, progress forward. So from that point, I, uh, I think I, I spoke to you before, I went and seeked help, which is my only key thing here really, is if you want to take anything away from mental health, is always to make sure you've got that support network. And my support network was my auntie. She was effectively like my second mum, but also at the same time, she had a capacity because she was, an NH she was a super NHS nurse retired nurse in the British NHS system. So she, she, she had that care capacity as well as providing, uh, you know, relative love, you know, family love bonding. And so, yeah, she brought me, she brought me back on my feet again. I wouldn't say perfect because nothing, nothing's ever fixed. So it's all about moving forward. And it got to a point where I was on my feet, I could stand up, I could really not think about anything at all, couldn't cope with anything. I lost love with sport. I uh, just lost love with life, but she gradually got me going again. And of course, life threw up a curveball. And uh, yeah, she was diagnosed with cancer. So I had to switch capacity and care for her. And then of course, I lost her relatively quite short within like months. 
And um, so I was back to kind of square one again, but she gave me something like a very, very small foundation to sort of keep progressing um, forward. So, but it was, a, it was a long, hard road. It was a case of like, you know, I eventually got to where I am today. And even today isn't, I never ever always look at life and think it's perfect. It's yeah. not perfect, is it? Who is ever perfect, but it's how you kind of cope with it. So yeah, everything's kind of like great on that. <laughs> I've just got some food here. <laughs> oh, that's that's brilliant. I wonder where my uh, my delivery is. <laughs> I've just got a delivery of food. Just going off topic. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. So, again, I'm wondering where my <laughs> delivery is. No. Um, well, well, James, thank you for for sharing that. And uh, you know, uh, part of this, you've 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 spoken to me about before. And uh, I, I feel very honoured and grateful that you, you share that story because I think it does provide some perspective on life in general. Because as you say, honestly, like g getting to know you, the first, the first couple of times I spoke to you and started getting to know you, you're such a you know, uh, smiling, happy, positive, vibrant person. Um, and and then getting to know you even more, realizing that you know it's obviously you're like everyone else, <laughs> like mm -hmm. obviously you're a human, um, and you, you have those stories. And I think it is such an important thing to talk about that life's not perfect. I don't, you know, I I, I really think that's something that we need to be careful about going after. Uh, having as a goal or uh, an illusion that life is or should be perfect and and I, I'm gonna be a bit uh, challenging I think we'll see how well this goes over <laughs> but what you said about you know from day zero up till year 37 mm. You had very few challenges or obstacles uh, thrown in your, your way. I mean, you're, I remember even you telling me you, you used to have a full set of hair and your beautiful white teeth. Like you were this, you know, uh, this just role model, this, this, this uh, uh, how do you say that? This uh, divine thing. Um, and, and so I can imagine it was an easy thing for you, you know, mm. plus... Besides looking great, doing well in sports and everything, you were also academically uh, skilled. Mm. So I have this theory, uh, and <laughs> it's a personal theory, <laughs> and it is that if if you have it very, e if if it's very easy in life, y you could lose out on learning and building skills that can serve you and help you when you're faced with hardship. Mm. And, and I, I go back to my own uh, childhood. And I, I, growing up, I was bullied quite a lot because I was very different. And, um, but I, I always stayed, stayed true to myself, which, <laughs> which then put me in that position. I always got bullied because I, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't adapt. So they, they just kept on hitting me. Um, but because I wasn't necessarily popular that way, uh, I had to develop a personality. I had to develop mm. skills, coping mechanisms, ways to reframe and, and, and frame certain scenarios. And I think those skills helped me in, uh, in, in later on in life. Mm. Uh, when I was in a conflict or if I was put up against a challenge I didn't really know how to solve, I had some innate ability to like, okay, let's, let's deconstruct this. Let's mm. work on this. Some of the people, some of the guys that bullied me, uh, they were very pretty guys. They were, you know, they had it easy from, from my perspective, at least they were very popular with the girls. Um, they were sports people. So, you know, they were very popular in school in general. And uh, so things looked very easy. Now, obviously, I don't know, but it looked very easy from, from my perspective, from where I was lying down on the ground looking up to them. <laughs> um, and later on in life, from, again, my perspective, I could see that for some of these guys, 
they struggled with um, life. So what was very easy, fun, and, and, and just natural play for them as, as young adults, later on became much, much more of a challenge when they didn't, well, well probably when they realized they didn't learn the skills to navigate life in, in other ways. Now, again, I am going to say full disclaimer, I do not have any scientific facts about, around this. But there is a quote, a quote I really like and sometimes can, can shine some light on this. And it's, you know, if, if you make it easy on yourself, life gets hard. If you dare to make it slightly hard, life gets easy. Now, I modified the, the quote a bit just to fit this, this conversation. What I mean by that is, if it's too easy, life will get hard because you're not building strength. It's like going to the gym and only lifting the the one kilos or three kilos weights, I mean, you're not going to progress. You're not going to learn. You're not going to be stronger. If you make it harder for yourself, if you dare to lift heavier weights every week, every month, well, you're going to get stronger. So things are going to be easier. Lifting that gym bag is going to be easier. Uh, climbing that tree is going to be easier. And I think that is really something that is important for us to, to learn. Now, what <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, James? No, definitely. I mean, those can be applied to business as well, can't they? I mean, I've, t I've told you a scenario in terms of really my private life upbringing to where I got to, you know, certainly worst case scenario five, six years ago to where I am now. And of course, you know, you know me very well with uh, Agata. This is really for me, in terms of starting a business, is something brand new. Of course, mental health comes into that. And what you just said there is absolutely right in terms of business. Running a business is bloody hard work. <laughs> um, of course, it's going to have, you know, consequences on your mental health. But yeah, you've got to have a little bit of hard knocks from that and learn from it. However, could I have started a business five years ago? I don't think I would have had the mental uh, capacity. Um, and I think some of that is mainly down to the fact that Maybe it's not educated enough at school, um, you know, because of that, you know, I imagine somebody going through life and sometimes you can probably equate to it as being luck. You know, like for me, you were just lucky that you got from zero, <laughs> day zero to where you are now. You were lucky, you know, to where you ended up being. I mean, my mate, a close mate of mine, I wouldn't necessarily say he had like major crises, but he had life's shit kick him in the teeth from time to time. I hope YouTube didn't pick that up. <laughs> but, just, <laughs> but just life sort of like, you know, maybe, you know, something like, you know, when he was in his 20s, his parents may have, uh, you know, they divorced or separated. So another little crisis moment, say five years or 10 years uh, later. Do you know what I mean? So it was like kind of a slightly reg irregular, but up and down movement through life. Well, I just, co I kind of just really sort of coasted coasted forward and I didn't know until I hit a major, you know, storm, a whirlwind that I just couldn't cope with at all. So when I look at it, I kind of like then stem from it as a, well, how was I to, how was I to know? Or how would I deal with that? And I think mm. sometimes that kind of comes down to the case of maybe we don't actually educate on mental health enough at schools because of A, the stigma around it, um, and yeah, we don't edu we don't educate. We don't we don't talk enough about it. And I don't actually mean really from an education point of view, is but we don't talk enough about mental health from mm. you know an early an early age. So we're never mm. pre so we're never prepared for it. So when life does throw up its curveballs, I'm trying not to swear here. I don't want to be a Gary Vider joke. <laughs> <laughs> but when life does throw a curveball in there, we don't really have that capacity. I don't think mm. or education. Mm. to know what to do what to do next uh, yesterday i was listening to a podcast it, it was an old episode i think from 2019 or so uh f on impact theory with uh, tom bayou or bayou um uh, yeah. i i can't pronounce the name the guy who wrote uh, homo uh, homo sapiens uh, the yeah. book uh yari hari something i so, i'm very very sorry that i'm butchering his name he's a brilliant <laughs> brilliant man yeah, <laughs> I to look him up. yeah yeah and um 
you know, he's, he's Israeli, he's from Israel. Uh, he, he's such a super accomplished uh, person. And he was talking about that the future of, of, of just the, the workforce or the, the environment of, of, of business or even school is really about adaptability. Mm. Because he was saying like, what's gonna happen in the future is that things are gonna move so incredibly fast mm. that you're gonna have to reinvent yourself every seven or 10 years. Mm. So, cause he, he got the question by, from, from Tom Bayou, um, you know, what would be your advice? People are going to, so someone's gonna apply to college. What would you tell them? Is it a good idea? What should they think about? What, where, where should they go? What should they study? And he said, that's a really, really hard question. Mm. And that, so the simple answer was, you probably should study more about AI, artificial mm. intelligence. He said, because, you know, that, that's an easy answer. But he said that the complex one is, you should probably study uh, emotional intelligence and change management. Mm. And there was a third one, I think, as well. Um, but th those two stood out for me because I, I, I felt that what he was talking about is be equipped, be equipped to handle change, mm. to handle curveballs, mm. because no one else will teach you that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And so far, school are, are, schools are lacking. I, I'm absolutely, I'm very optimistic. We will catch up at one point. The question is when. Mm. Um, and before, before school does, before society starts having these conversations, we need to take that responsibility. And I think today, James, together, you know, the two of us, thanks to you sharing this story, I think we are actually having that conversation today. Of course I think are, yeah. one of the really, really important topics are um, prepare, uh, handle change. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how you should say that because I'm absolutely a firm believer of uh, change management because my actual, my actual really strong, I suppose, career background was project management. Mm. Project management is really all about change. Well, it's yeah. either change management, but also to include in that, you've got risk management as well. Correct. Correct. Now, I could do that for work. That's no issue whatsoever. I could do that for work. But to apply that to everyday life, I somehow was in a, um, you know, I was in a cloud. It was almost like I had to really sort of retrain like my brain. Yeah here's one thing i was i mean those things i'm talking about in terms of the sort of intensity of chaos that i was living in is only we're only talking about i'm probably only talking around about sort of five six years now when i told you the scenario where i was in a mental health hospital see this is a stupid thing i say mental health hospital which is what it is but there's still in my head a stigma to it yeah. Do you know what I get? I kind of think I'm I'm saying this, but it's you know it's true. And to sit there, to I know you shouldn't kind of like dwell on the past, but sometimes you need to reflect on it. And I kind of oh, think yes. to myself, like if I could sort of be in the situation where I was in the health, uh, mental health hospital, and think to myself, uh, yeah, I'm going to be in five years' time in the future. I'm going to be on Tenerife, uh, in the sunshine, with a beautiful girl. <laughs> She's come out. Yeah, a big share with a, be with a beautiful girlfriend, and have my own business. And don't, and don't get me wrong, they, you know, businesses all come with their own um, hardship as well challenges. and challenges. But I would never ever dream of thinking that was going to be the case. So my point is, is, is that I think you said this. I'm going to pinch what you what you said. If, so if it. you ever go for a job interview and someone says, "Where do you want to be in five years' time?" You can tell them that doesn't exist. I was, and again, I was going to say something else, but yeah, um, exactly. You can, yeah, you can say that's not the case. You don't, you, 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 you can't, you can't plan for that. You don't know what's going to happen in five in five years' time. You know, a year is probably very sketchy. You know, mm. even mm. if I can, even if I look at say Cruise Creative as all new businesses, it's only really in Earn, earnest in terms of like its full potential it's probably actually a hundred percent of our time it's only probably been kind of going for about over a year mm -hmm. um it has been our side hustle 
but in terms of its kind of like full time capacity, that changes all the time. Completely changes all the time. So if you turn around to me and say, "What's Cruise Creative going to be in five years' time?" Out the door. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Precisely. No, and I, I, I absolutely think you're right. I mean, and and when we talked about that, there is like the flip side to that is if you make no changes at all, chances are we can predict your future. Like if you did exactly the same thing as you did yesterday, and you keep doing that day after day. Mm. chances are we're going to be able to predict where you are with maybe a 10 percent you know different different di different difference difference yeah yeah difference yeah, yeah. uh now <clears throat> and i i think because that's that's a lot of times that's been where i meet some of my clients like what's your default future mm. the default future is basically the future that will happen unless mm. you change something yeah, yeah, exactly. So you always have that chance or that opportunity to change uh, and, and create the future. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Someone wise said, I, I can't, I don't, it wasn't me. So I'm just putting it up there. <laughs> um, and, and at the same time, as I said, I, that's you, they usually, that was usually my way of, of talking about the default future. But because we're in this time right now, where things will change for you, whether or not you want it, mm. right? We've got COVID, like that thing, nobody wanted or controlled or, or you know, saw, saw happen. Mm. And yet it did. And it transformed life as we know it. Mm. There's going to be more situations like that. Hopefully mm. not necessarily as severe, hopefully not involving health. It can be disruptions to uh, education, it can be AI in 5, 10, 15 years that will completely change the way we look at uh, uh, work or, or something like that. Mm. So I think today it's even more important that in the past, maybe you could put yourself on that trajectory. You're going like, yeah, this is a good life. I'm just going to, you know keep my head down and do the work and, and, and 25 years from now, I'm going to retire with a gold watch and things are going to be fantastic. That's probably not a possibility anymore because things mm. will change. And as, yeah. as I said, from that podcast, every seven to 10 years, you're probably going to have to reinvent yourself, whether you like it or not. Mm. No, it's true. I mean, like even from, you know, cruise creative point of view, we're always constantly adapting all the time you know like say two technologies one of which is this we're getting more yeah. in, involved into uh live streaming uh which is yeah just before this show i was already involved yeah. um on the production side in a live stream and then we're coming to this. so we, we're kind of constantly um adapting all the time and again you know do i still suffer with um anxiety yeah of course i do because yeah, you know, I've got that thought that, you know, to be the best, we need to change all the time. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a, a, a Gata will kind of agree uh, with me on this, is I'm a complete perfectionist as well. Mm -hmm. So I always want something to be absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. So I want things to be perfect because I believe that's the greater good, you know, for the company. So I take, really, sometimes I take too much time and investment in my company don't get me wrong i have a passion for it so if i have mm -hmm. a passion for it i absolutely love it and i love it and i go forward and it doesn't feel like work but the main thing is is it's not sustainable <laughs> you know sometimes what i have you... to <laughs> go on, yeah, sorry what, what you makes you say? say that i think sometimes it does take a takes a toll on you again you know like for me in terms of like looking after one's uh, mental health you know, mm -hmm. you can't constantly kind of work all the time. Your mm. brain needs to switch off, you know, mm -hmm. and be good at other things. So I'm good at what I'm doing with my own work, but I also need to have that relaxation and switch on to something else and still be good mm. at that because mm. I, I kind of take that through everything really. I, I suppose I've got a little bit of um, uh, an addictive personality. So if I take something up, I'll try and do it because that perfectionism comes in. So, you know, you, you know, I'm starting to do surfing. I'm starting to mm -hmm. do um, volleyball. 
Uh, and of course, I know for a fact it'll be like, I only want to take it as a relaxing sport, but it won't be. I'll be kind of like 100% in it. But it is a break from work though as well. Mm. So if I play volleyball, guess what I'm not doing? I'm not on my mobile phone. Correct. Uh, and I think sometimes, you know, we're kind of involved in technology as well, which is, it, it is a little bit more taxing and it does have uh, an impact on your mental health. I, I read the other day about because of COVID, and of course, with COVID brings uh, mental health issues, but also because people have adapted and they're starting to work more online remotely, guess what's happening now is we're having more and more Zoom meetings. And it's almost the case of we're having more, we're having an overload of um, Zoom meetings because we now can't go into the office place. So there's recommendations now about limiting, you know, Zoom call, you know, Zoom yeah. calls to protect one's mental, mental health. So for me, yeah. that, that's one of the what, what that's one of the main things I've got to be careful of is because I am a perfectionist. I will put something in one hundred and ten percent, and I know I have to stand back and take. Mm. To take a break and do something else and look after myself be mm. number one for me for myself sometimes as well yeah so we've got some a couple of questions here um the one we we have on screen right now what has been the biggest challenge from the time you had to restart until now James? until now do you know what i think actually one of the one of the challenges and i'm still actually I'm still actually coming to terms with it myself and actually doing this uh, show now is actually is actually helping because I could quite easily turn around and say, do you know what? That was actually a short episode of my life. Let's forget about it. That didn't happen, <laughs> you know, mm. but the point is, is again, it comes back to stigma. I am sometimes still a little bit kind of like uncomfortable about talking about it, but it's a case of, hang on, do you know what? I've actually gone through that. I actually should share that experience with other people mm. so i think the actual the actual restart the restart of everything is like it's really it's a really difficult it is a difficult um, process you know yeah. on the on the on the way to you know recovery there was a lot of um so, so, sort of makeups that had, had to be made um like even like with my own parents, my own parents are kind of, uh, well, my dad's 78. I forget how old my mum is. 67, I think she is. Um, it was cool. <laughs> I know, yeah. Of course, they were, there was a relationship meant there because, you know, I, there was such a lot of like hard pain. So, yeah. you know, for that, for me, it's a, it's a case that, that was the biggest reason to kind of like come to terms with it, come to terms with it, but also in the background to have a strategy to fix it because as I would say, I still suffer with it. But not at the not at the great um, extent of what happened, you know, five six years ago. I've just got a good tool and mechanism in place that fixes it. And one of which is, I spoke to it was, a, it was actually a counsellor from. Um, what happens is when you go to that, they, they give you crisis teams. They actually call mm -hmm. it the crisis team. They give you a crisis team, effectively, you know, a counsellor um you've got you've got the support of them one of which was absolutely fantastic really but again comes down to common sense if it's like you know from a mental health issue point of view was how she told me was to recognize it as uh, a traffic light system so you've got your green amber uh, and red where do you actually fit into that and what actions you should take when you're in that certain level actually what came out of that was was it was actually very rare that it, personally myself would be in the green because the green is like you know it's all rosy everything's perfect life's perfect. generally speaking you're kind of like hovering in between that bottom end scale of the green and the, and the amber that's how I kind of recognized it mm -hmm. but the problem was was um how do you recognize it when you're in the red mm -hmm. and how do you how do you get out of that and how do you escalate forward from it so it, it's kind of, yes, it's training. It comes back down to education, training, making sure you've got the right mechanisms in place. And when I dropped down into that red zone, it was a case of, right, okay, I know I'm in the red. What do I do? What do I do to make sure it doesn't go down further? Because you can imagine if you're at the bottom end of the red, that's when it's... Yeah. It's a shame we can't swear on this show. 
Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but when you but when you're at the bottom end of the red, it's but you've yeah. got that support mechanism. You've got a mechanism in place. And mine really, I found was what I would what I noticed or what I identified was is if I was having trouble and I was having issues, I would actually drop away from society. Mm. I would lose love with sport. I would lose love with uh, friends. Just don't want to be associated to them. Mm. And of course, then it stemmed into business. So it was affecting your business and your and your, and your work life. So to identify that, I think the massive key for for me was to make sure you have a support network in place. That can be your loved ones. That can be you know a close friend, your colleagues as well. Don't forget, is you know the people now because it's more prevalent and it's more widespread, you know, and there's a little less. So I think we've still got a long way to go. I think that's what you you actually agreed on before. We've still got a long way to go, but the yeah. stigma is a little bit less. Your work colleagues are there to help as well. Mm. I mean, nine times out of ten, the, the, there's another person in the room that's suffering just as much as what as what you are. Mm. You know, there's only so much I can hide behind a smile. Mm. Mm. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> now I think you're absolutely onto something super important, and I think there are even studies done on this that. One of the things that tends to happen, especially when we're depressed, for example, um, mm. is that we retreat, we isolate ourselves. But actually, what seems to help is if we go into social uh, engagements. Mm. Now, if, if being depressed, and I, I've, I've had that my, myself, being depressed, the last thing you want to do is go out with friends or hang around people. At least that was the case for me. I, I just wanted to pull the, you know, the covers over my yeah, head yeah, yeah. and just go back to bed. But it's actually very, very useful and even important that we do surround ourselves with people because it's, there, is this, there is a little bit of um, a dopamine or endorphins that get released when you're around people. But there's also the oxytocin hormone, which is the bonding hormone. So when you do get around and, you know, you're spending time with people, you start feeling better. Um, and I, I, I want to even make up a, um, a connection here with we got new, uh, mirror neurons. Basically, what we see, we mirror in terms of uh, empathy and, and we, we, we start experiencing that, which is just why we're such a hyper social uh, species. Mm. Now, if you then are around people who seem to have a good time slowly slowly your mind is reshaping itself reconditioning itself slightly to sort of mirror what it's experiencing hmm. so i think it is and I, I i again you can find the studies on this uh I, i've read several books around this topic and it points to that we need the support system we are a social species hmm. and 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 we should use that it's just counter intuitive when we're actually feeling depressed we just want to hide but what we actually need is is uh to reach out for help reach out yeah, and connect and bond yeah it's one of I our guests' favorite word that you know oxytocin yeah, yeah. <laughs> she she's a big she fan says, she's a big fan of oxytocin yeah. Yeah, Andrea often says, you know, uh, Andrea is is not a very addictive person, but it's one thing she is addicted to. It's oxytocin. She, you know, closeness and and romance and all kinds of things. <laughs> so uh, we've got a really, you know, again, uh, there was a brilliant question from Agata. I think maybe we could spend maybe the couple of last minutes to to answer some of these questions. This yeah, yeah. one in particular, uh, I kind of want to go back to the, the just the previous one, Nagata, and, and then, yeah. So from Rafiq, um, Rafa. do you have any specific tools, <laughs> rituals that help you get out of the red zone? The red zone is actually a very difficult one because um, yeah. for, for, for me, it depends on kind of what level you, you're at in that mm -hmm. red zone. And in terms of the bottom zone, I'll be, this, this, this was for me at the time in terms of, how I, how I would identify it and apply it to myself. And I'm going to be quite frank about it, but sure. the bottom end of that kind of like red zone for me is almost like it's complete kind of like despair. Um, what they actually teach you on how, and educate you on is, is really is when you're approaching the red zone. So you're sort yeah. of in that state of between green and amber 
and then you so slowly have that mechanism of when you're sort of drifting into that um, red zone. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's, well, he says actually all rituals. I wouldn't necessarily say it's uh, rituals. The, the specific tool in place is actually, funny enough, when I, when I mentioned it before, is actually a reach out to your support network. That support network is your stakeholder mm. in mm. your mental health. So, you know, your sake, I mean, for example, in, the, in this case, um, my immediate stakeholder is uh, Agatha. Funny enough, my actual other stakeholders are my parents. And my parents mm. are a few thousand miles away. Yeah. Um, but if I was ever sort of, yeah, in that complete despair, I kind of, it, it, it sounds a little bit kind of like, matter of fact or or maybe some people would turn around to it and go what really you would just kind of do that it's like yeah it's recognizing it so you don't get to that bottom level and you know all despair is lost as you're approaching it you know i can quite quickly in terms of everybody's adapted to it now of being online i used to call my when i first moved to tenerife before the adoption of like live streaming or zoom calls i used to actually do the old-fashioned just pick up the phone only because of the fact that I never actually had any real trust in my mum using technology believe it or not but she's absolutely she's super great on video yeah and yeah, I do like you course. know like video calls but you know what that's I mean I know we're in a state everybody's in a state where we don't have that physical human bond connection but even so um yeah from a sort of tool point of view is make sure from the red is you call out to your stakeholders in your mental health mm that's yeah for me that's Good absolutely one. critical and and let me just stress that a bit more i think the key thing there as you said is catch it before it goes there like be proactive mm. that yeah, the yeah. trick is to not really get into the red zone although yeah, yeah. we're not saying that you you shouldn't or you can't because you mm. will that it might happen yeah of course yeah you yeah, do the skill is to look, tell uh, have the tell signs that's People. exactly it. It's the skill. It's the education. If I didn't have, if I didn't have this education, yep. I mean, most people will kind of think, well, I don't know. You, you take a magic uh, pill for that, or you know, you, it just happens. It's like no, it doesn't happen. You actually, like you would do with schooling, if you were like learning maths or whether you're learning English, you will actually become educated on it. So you yep. recognise that. So yep. yeah, it is. It is an acquired skill set that you adopt. So yep. you take. So it's education still which we've mentioned before, it's a skill that you acquire. So yeah, of course you're going to dip into, um, I wish I had it actually as a graph, but you, you're kind of like tipping on the edge if you see what I mean. It's like that, it's like that rev counter, I suppose, on a car. It's like when you mm. just slightly get into the red, yep. you know, but you don't want to be like way over the other side. You don't want to be in that 4,000 like revs. It's just as you approach into the red and it's having, like you say, that skill set to recognize it yep. and then to put your yeah your your crisis management plan it into place yeah that's exa exactly I mean, exactly one it. thing that i often do and and this can be applied to almost anything we do but i'll ask people uh you know in in, in this case perhaps clients i'll ask them so what's the warning signal because to be honest most people we we do know certain mm. Warning yeah, signals. Yeah. We know, like you know, if I if I wake up in the middle of the night, if I can't yeah. sleep, or if I if I easily irritated, like they will know their own signs for when things are going south. Mm. Um, and sometimes just having that open conversation, going like, so what would be the warning signal? When would you yeah, yeah. kind of know things are not going as it should? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I often say that in and this goes into anything, like if because this applies to that. If you're in a fight, for example, with your partner or a friend or a colleague, it's extremely hard a lot of times to take yourself out of that fight, that, that situation and go like, okay, like, let, let's, let's be rational about this. Mm. A lot of times we're emotional. Mm. It's, it's only when you move away from that situation that you're able to go like, oh, I should have, I should have backed yeah. off, I should have done this, I should have done that. You can use that, um, you know, hindsight uh, to create what I call, in case of emergency, break the glass, mm. right? You know, you, you've got these hammers yeah, on buses the, yeah, or whatever, yeah. right? So in a, in a sober state, and I'm not talking about, you, you know, the opposite being <laughs> intoxicated, but like, you know, out of anger or, or frustration or sadness, yeah. in a sober state of mind, yep. 
sit down for 10 minutes, 15 mm. minutes, and create your own in case of emergency break the glass plan, mm -hmm. yeah. which is kind of like, if this happens, then I will. Mm -hmm. So that, and then you, you get clear on what are the warning signals. Mm -hmm. Well, usually it's this, this, and that. Okay, cool. So that's the point when that happens, this is you breaking the glass, reaching for the hammer, and roll out that plan, which could be yeah. meditate, go for a retreat, uh, go for a spa, take mm -hmm. a walk, sleep in a couple of days, or whatever. And that, that's exactly it. I mean, even when I, even when I explained before, sort of like the, the, three, the three tiers, mm. the green, the amber, and the red, even in the amber, I can recognize it. You put it quite nicely when you sort of like break the glass, you know, <laughs> like, you know <laughs> first aid emergency. Yeah. But even in amber, the, the, the simple warning signs would be a, a case of, as my normal routine would be, I go for a 10K run on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday, for, for argument's mm -hmm. sake. Mm -hmm. If I drop off that, that's a warning sign. And that's a, mm -hmm. I know that's kind of very simplistic, but it's a warning sign, and it is actually telling me, this is not where I want to be. The previous week, I was actually somewhere hovering just in that green zone or, you know, just above the amber zone. But then all of a sudden, I've kind of like, I'm going to admit, I've dropped off running and I'm not eating very well. Because I go the, I go the opposite way, actually. You know, if I'm in the stress, I don't eat. I don't eat a lot. I eat mm -hmm. less. Yeah. And yes, yeah, sleep goes out. So, it, the, yeah, it's like you say, you, you recognize those patterns. And it's like, oh. There's a warning. There's a warning sign there. Mm -hmm. I need to do something about it to basically retract and get that line back into um, green. Yeah, yeah, great. So we got got, got a reply from uh, Rafik. Uh, I totally agree, and I think it's really important not to approach the red zone too close, causing because it may be really hard to get out of it and uh, refill the fuel. Uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly. It. Yeah, that's, that's exactly precisely it. it. Yeah, and if in, you in do, my yeah. Sorry, in yeah. my in my in my plan, um, my, mine is 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 there's a certain point I cannot get into that bottom end of the red zone because no. that for me is despair. Yeah. You know. So yeah. of course we we all have life where it's you know like I say I'll get a curveball every every week. You know, maybe even sometimes every day, especially with, with kind of like business. And then it's just recognizing it and just making sure it's just right. Just right for me. But of course, you know, there's always going to be that issue somewhere. Yep. No, I think it's great. All right. So um, we've got a last question. I'll, I think we'll just see if we can get into that. And, and uh, to, to end on a good note, I was thinking, you know, if guys, if people want to connect with you, James, so before we answer this last question, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you on social media or on the, on the web? Social media or web website address is cruisecreative.agency. Oh, I got to yeah. just throw it up or onto Great. the screen there. Get us on Instagram at cruise.creative. And also you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. You've got an event. I, I just want to say this as well. You, you're a speaker at, at, at a, an upcoming summit or events yep. for yep. social media managers and managing, right? Yeah, yeah. Social media I, pro. So it's yeah. a virtual event that's um, hosted in the US. And of course, because of COVID, it's all moved to uh, virtual. So I'm a guest speaker. I'm talking about agile methodologies in your, con in your digital content creation. Yeah. But Social Media Pro on March the 18th. There's that's a plug amazing. for you straight away. So get signed up. <laughs> I'll put a link in the top later. <laughs> yeah, precisely. There you go. Because you run the show. <laughs> You can I do don't that. forget to I don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the and notification smash button. The notification <laughs> button. Smash it. <laughs> so let's answer the last question, yeah? Um, yeah. and it, I, I think was it was addressed it? to both of us. Uh, was it? so maybe I go word? first and then I'll I'll just leave you with the final uh, couple of words and you know yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll be done with this. So what do you Can think I, have you've sorry. learned about yourself during your journey as an entrepreneur, both of you? As a journey journey as an entrepreneur. Wow. Oh god, uh, no, that's a well, I, I'll give you some time to think about it as I'm answering it. Um, I, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I was into personal development before I became an entrepreneur. Mm. When I became an entrepreneur, I really developed. I grew. Mm. And it goes back to my analogy going to the gym. Personal development in the books was easy. Mm. 
But once you actually start practicing it as an entrepreneur, because as you said, you're faced with so many different things. As an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, you need to learn so many different things. Like you need to be good at so many other things. I used to work for IKEA. I was brilliant at what I did, but I did one thing. It was easy. Mm. <laughs> Everybody else <laughs> ran the company. Now I need to do that. I need to be freaking the whole of IKEA running my own company. Yeah. So that was the biggest challenge, the biggest um, learning opportunity was the fact that I think running your own business is one of the best ways to have self, uh, uh, personal development, self-improvement uh, opportunities. And, and I was surprised to find that out and I'm super grateful that I did and I'm on mm. that path. I'll leave no, it to I you. Completely, no, I completely agree with you uh, there. I never realized, and I'm going to cheat a little bit here, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and say, yeah, you're right there. I can completely agree with you. That's what I was thinking of as well. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but multitasking, but no, but it's true, multitasking yeah. like in business. So like, you know, before, uh, you know, before, you know, Cruise Creative, I was really kind of just a sole, when I think about it now, I was just a sole digital project manager. You know, yeah. I came from university as a web developer. Uh, so I was a coder in, I can't remember what, what the language was, C++. C++. Then I went into web um, development. And then I got a bit bored of it because I wanted more human interaction, but I still wanted to stay with that industry. Uh, and I went into project management. And I just thought, you know, that'll be it. Project management, put my feet up. You know, it was fairly easy. Just, I'm not saying you turn up for the web, but it's fairly easy, fairly automated. And then all of a sudden, come over to Tenerife and then decide, I mean, I did all sorts of jobs in Tenerife, but in the background using Cruise Creative as a side hustle. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, you know what's the hardest thing is actually learning how to run a business. So, you know, just like turn up and kind of, I'm not project manager anymore. Um, you know, I have to do my own books. I have to do, you know, cause that's really a new skill set as well, because I'm not really doing web development anymore. So it wasn't something I fell back on. Do I take project management along? Yeah, of course. That's, mm -hmm. that's a given. So I'm like ticking the box because I know that skill set. But everything else, the amount of caps that you have to wear to be a business person. Mm. But at the same time, a case of like five years ago, when I say that, you know, that kind of crisis moment and thinking five years forward, well, would I be doing what I'm doing now? No way. I needed to, again, educate myself, get that skill set for my own uh, mental health in order to achieve what I've done so far within business. So it all goes hand in hand. Yeah, I wear all the many caps that are involved in running um, a business as, a, as an entrepreneur. But at the same time, I know how to look after myself, A, physically, and also in my uh, mental wellness. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, uh, that's it. That's a wrap. <laughs> I can't even believe it's an hour. No, exactly. And, you know, I, I held to hold, I was, I, I ha had to hold back because I was just, I just wanted to go further. Uh, good. <laughs> James, thank you very, very much for, uh, for getting on the show, uh, not just being behind the, the, the show and, and making it this, this amazing thing. And of course, thank you, Agatha, for, for being the second half of this and, and supporting us. I am super grateful, James, that you did bring this conversation to the table. Uh, I, I, I saw a comment from Annika before that, you know, at least give it another hour. Uh, you could easily talk more about this. Here we go. One more, more hour, guys, more of this. <laughs> and I agree with that. I, I think that is it's such an important topic. And maybe that's something we can make happen in the future anyway. Um, Definitely. I mean, I, I want to say to everyone who's, who's watching live or, or catching the replay, please, please, please do connect with James. Connect with James, connect with Agatha. They are really, really inspiring people when it comes to life and business in general, really. Um, so you, you've got all of those links down there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really what I want to say from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank you very much, James, for being on the show. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that was a quick cutaway. Um, Thank you, friends, for, for being uh, with me on this one. I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful, as I said. Um, many, many thanks for, for you guys watching live. Um, 
if uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, as we've said before, don't forget to like and subscribe and, and smash that notification bell so that you get to be notified every time we go live and also for any other content that we put out. And, and there is a lot of content that we do try to put out there for you. If you're on Facebook, you can always follow my uh, Facebook page, Adam Kabalik Life Coach. Uh, you can even connect with me personally if you if you feel like that's a good fit. Again, I'm super grateful for having you uh, on the show today. And uh, thank you, James, again. Guys, see you next week, Wednesday, 6 p.m. London time. We are talking to a couple, uh, a couple who travel the world working and living abroad. And uh, I'm not going to say much more than that. If that's something you dream about, you should definitely tune in next week, Wednesday. All right. Be well. See you soon.